uh, watching either on AFTV or on Facebook or one of the other outlets. We're just so thankful that you could be here with us uh, to worship God today. Amen. Last night, uh, Karen knocked on the door. I was in my office studying. She said, you want to go for a walk? It's a full moon. And uh, I think it was like 99% full moon because today it is. Because you realize today is the beginning of Passover. And that if you go back 1,990 years ago today, this is when Jesus was uh, suffering for your sins and for mine. It's that time of year. And so this is, I think, a, a special time for us to remember the, um, the climax in the plan of salvation, which is all revolving around the cross. Our message today is going to be dealing with the words of Christ from the cross. Now, you could probably even be more aptly said, the last words of Christ from the cross. You know, sometimes we, we know, we hear about people's last words. I don't know if you're aware from history, Napoleon's sister, Elisa, was dying, and someone in the room observed, nothing was as certain as death. And they didn't realize Elisa was still listening, and she said, except taxes. And that became one of the most widely quoted last words in history. You've heard that before, nothing is as certain as death and taxes. Alexander the Great, when he was dying, he had no successor. And he was dying, they believe, of either malaria or poisoning. They asked him, who will rule in your place? His wife was pregnant, but he had no heir yet. And he said, the strongest. And as a result of that, his kingdom descended in battles between his generals fighting, but they were prophetic. It was the strongest that would rule. Yerlik Zwingli, the great reformer, his last words were, they can kill the body, but not the soul. William Carey, the famous missionary. Karen and I just got done listening to um, a book on his life. He said, when I am gone, speak less of Dr. Carey and more of Dr. Carey's Savior. And when Susanna Wesley was dying, she told her family that was gathered around, don't grieve, but sing a song of praise to God. His people had good attitudes. You've got some examples in the Bible of last words. In Genesis 49, 33, Jacob, before he died, he gathered his sons around. He blessed and foretold their futures. It says, when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into his bed and he breathed his last. He wanted to encourage and inspire his sons. Deuteronomy 33, verse 1. Now, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel. Moses blessed them before his death. Joshua gathered Israel together, and you know what he said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some of his final words. He challenged them. David, before he died, 2 Samuel 23, 1. Now these are the last words of David. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he challenged them. 2 Peter. You know, Jesus told Peter, you're going to die for me. Peter wrote in his last letter, Knowing shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as the Lord has shown me. Paul, before he died, he wrote in 2 Timothy, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. These are some of the last words of the Bible heroes. But of course, no last words are more important than the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. Now, it's a great thing if you can have your kids learn the Ten Commandments. I hope they know that. And uh, I actually went to a Catholic school where the one thing that I learned was they told us to memorize the Beatitudes. And I think I could still do most of them. But how many of you have ever taught your children to remember the seven last statements of Jesus from the cross? You know, contained in the statements that Jesus made from the cross. So all of that is, it, none of it was by accident. Everything he said from the cross is calculated to tell us something about the plan of salvation to bring us some encouragement and even to challenge us. The last words of Christ are filled with very great importance. Now you heard in our scripture reading, 
those heart-wrenching words of the crucifixion. And Jesus, from the time in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he said, not my will, thy will be done for the last time, the third and the last time, he surrendered into the Father's hands that he would be the sin bearer. There was no other way to save you and me. And he went through a terribly excruciating torture, not just on the cross. And crucifixion was horrible. But then they would they'd whip you in advance. And he was probably also beaten by the Sanhedrin before Pilate had his soldiers work him over. Then he was beat up by Herod's soldiers. And he was, he was uh, mocked and derided and spit upon. And they snatched out his beard. And, and uh, just he went through this terrible suffering. All of it is really what we deserve for sin. But the greatest suffering for Christ was being separated from the Father. For the first time in eternity, there was a breach, a gulf, a chasm between the Father and the Son. And he was separated and experienced the darkness that every lost soul faces when you face the second death. And that was the thing that I thought uh, that we believe hurt him more than anything. You read in Luke 23, 33, and when they came to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So we're going to take the next few minutes and we're going to look carefully at the seven statements Jesus makes from the cross. The cross of Jesus was the pulpit for his final earthly sermon before the resurrection. So he preaches a sermon to us in these words. Now I'm going to begin by summarizing those words for you so you just have them at least clear in your mind. First, you've got an appeal. Father, forgive them. Then you've got words of affection. He remembers his mother and he commends his mother to John. You've got the words of assurance in what he speaks to the thief. You've got the words of abandonment where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then there are words of anguish when he says, I thirst. The words of accomplishment when he declares, It is finished. And ultimately the words of acceptance where he says, Into your hands I commend my spirit. So let's take those statements and find out what we can learn from these words of Christ from the cross. First of all, you read in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, the first one. This is the words of appeal. He says in Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments, and they cast lots. Of course, fulfilling that prophecy that you find in Psalm 22. Think about that. The first thing that Jesus says as his crucifixion begins, Father, forgive them. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father. And so, really, we can say, Lord, Father, Jesus, your Son, interceded for me. He said, please forgive them. I mean, what better argument can we have than the appeal of the Son? Now, some of you are thinking, well, that was just a specific prayer. Uh, that is not a prayer for the human race at large. Jesus is not saying, Father, forgive them, except he's talking about the Roman soldiers or the slaves that didn't realize what they were doing. And it's just them. I've heard preachers argue that, and pardon me, but they're arguing that in ignorance. No, Jesus is not just praying for the slaves that have to perform the crucifixion. I'm sure it includes them. But if you read in your Bibles, in Acts 3, verse 17, Peter is preaching. He's preaching to the religious leaders, to the Jews, and he says, Now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. So when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. I don't think that most of them really knew. And there were some who had a lot of evidence they were fighting against. But even Paul, Paul thought he was serving God when he was killing Christians. He did it in ignorance. All of us are really sinning in ignorance to some extent. So this is a prayer that Jesus is offering for every one of us. And it's amazing. So often when you hurt a person, I think it was Cicero, the Roman historian, that said when someone was crucified, it was so painful that they would curse everybody. They would curse the gods. They'd curse their family. They'd curse the soldiers. They would spit. And they were expecting that from Jesus. But as they began to go through the actual act of binding him to the tree and nailing his hands and his feet, and he'd already been 
just laying down with his back torn up the way it was and the crown of thorns, terrible suffering, from his lips pour forth love. You know, they say if you want to find out what's in a vessel, bump it. A lot of people, you bump them, you find out what's really inside. But when they bumped Jesus, when they pierced him, outflowed love. Earlier this week, I cut down a tree just out behind the church here. It was leaning and getting ready to fall. And as I was cutting, I smelt that sweet pine smell. It was a pine tree. And it's interesting. You cut it, and it smells sweet. And Jesus, when he was pierced, outflowed fragrance. Love poured out. You couldn't get him to be hateful or angry. He would not sin. Jesus gave an example to the apostles. What did Stephen do when he was stoned? Three and a half years later, when Stephen died for his faith, he said the same things as his master. He knelt down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin, praying for the forgiveness. And did God answer Stephen's prayer? Paul was forgiven and was converted. The very one there who was at the execution. And he said this, he fell asleep. Isaiah 53, verse 12, in this prophecy of the Messiah, he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. Right there, when he was being pierced, he prayed. He interceded for those who were executing him right there at the cross. Now, what else do we learn from this? He's setting an example. Now, we embrace the forgiveness that Jesus offers us individually, that he offers others but also he's telling us to follow his example and be forgiving. If Jesus can pray, Father, forgive them for the people who are crucifying him, his own nation, then none of us can say he doesn't know what it's like to be mistreated. And he calls upon us to forgive. Jesus said, Luke 6, 28, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Jesus, in spite of his personal pain, he prayed for them. Matthew 6, 14, If you forgive men your trespasses, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. I know that gets pretty raw sometimes. It's hard to forgive people that have really been mean. Ephesians 4, 32, Bible reiterates this is a tall order. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ forgave you. How are we to forgive each other? As God in Christ forgave us. Colossians 3.13 If anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you so you must do. He's telling us we must forgive. The people that were crucifying Jesus didn't say will you please forgive us for this? No. Before they even asked he forgave. I meet a lot of people who say, oh yeah, I'm willing to forgive my enemies, but they've got to ask me first. That's not how Jesus did it. You need to also forgive them because it's good for you. You don't want to, you know, someone said poison of unforgiveness destroys the container that holds it. And so if you're containing that, it's, it's eating you out. All right, Father, forgive them. He is praying for you at the cross. And it's only through the cross we can forgive others. So when we look at how he forgave us at the cross, it gives us the power to forgive others. When we see how he's willing to forgive us 10,000 talents, then we can go forgive others 40 pence. Second one, words of affection. You might even say words of adoption from the cross. John 19, 26, Jesus is hanging there on the cross, and you realize he's, he's crucified about 9 in the morning, and he's hanging on the cross seven hours in total from nine in the morning till about uh, three in the afternoon alive and then he dies and he's on the cross basically keeping the Sabbath. He's on the cross resting for one hour. But while he was hanging there earlier on, at first everyone stood away because the mob was so outrageous but eventually some of his followers drew near and when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, ostensibly John the Apostle, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to be in his own home. 
Now, first, practically, let me just explain what's happening. Jesus is giving his last will and testament. They took away his clothes, you know, that's all he had. And then the other thing is he's taking care of the provision for his mother. Joseph, we believe, had died a few years earlier. You may not be aware of this, but Jesus' brothers and sisters that it mentions were probably half-brothers and half-sisters from Joseph. Jesus was, you know, otherwise, logically, she would go into the house of one of her other children. But Jesus, knowing the commitment of John and how John loved Jesus, he said, I want you to watch out for my mother. He was also young, and this would provide for her for years to come. And it's believed, church, early church historians say that she stayed with John, he took care of her, and ultimately died in Antioch several years later. He kept that charge. But there's something much bigger that's happening here. When Jesus says, woman, behold your son, what was the first prophecy in the Bible? That the woman would bring forth the seed that would destroy the serpent, Genesis 3.15. This prophecy was being fulfilled at this very moment. In the blood of Christ is the anti-venom that destroyed the power of the devil. Jesus on the cross is crushing the head of the serpent. He says, you will bruise his heel. And of course, his heels were pierced at that point. And so when he says, woman, behold your son, that is a declaration for every believer through history as we are the church to look to the cross and say, this is the son that was foretold. This is the seed of the woman that we are to behold that destroys the head of the serpent. Can you say amen? So this is a great fulfillment. This is the climax of that prophecy. You know, even at the birth of Jesus, Simon, in the temple, he blessed Joseph and Mary, and he said to Mary, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. This was a fulfillment of that prophecy. Mary stood there with a broken heart. And you know, even his own mother did not understand the nature of those prophecies. She thought that at some point he was going to use his power and set himself up as the popularly expected Messiah. But before the crown came the cross, and most of the disciples did not understand that. Her soul was pierced. And then, of course, she was one of the first at the tomb, and she was then rejoicing along with everyone else. A sword will pierce through your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now Mary's looking at her son, but she's also looking at her Savior from sin. Mary was not sinless. Mary needed a Savior like everybody else. There's no scripture in the Bible that tells us that Mary was sinless. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Only Jesus is the one human who live without sin. Amen? And I should add, we are nowhere told to ask Mary to intercede in our behalf as though Jesus is too busy, we must go to his mother to get his attention. We are told we can all boldly come individually into the presence of God through Jesus. We don't need to pray and go through saints to reach him. Mary was a godly woman. She was a saint in the same way that all believers become saints. But uh, it's wonderful that Jesus cared. Does Jesus care about his family if he cared about his mother? Are we adopted into the family by the cross? We become sons of God through the blood of Jesus and through his sacrifice. And he says, woman, behold. The words are there, behold. Son, behold. What's in, contained in there? The Bible says, Jesus promises us, if I am lifted up, position of visibility, all will be drawn to me. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that says, does so easily beset us, and let us run that race with endurance, looking unto Jesus. By beholding Him on the cross, makes it a little easier for us to run the race and lay aside the sin. You know, it's hard for me to make excuses for my petty sins when I look at Jesus on the cross. And you see what your sin cost? You see how it hurt him? You see what he endured? And then for us to say, I know it hurts you, Lord, and for us to crucify him afresh with our sins, the cross is where we find the power to be transformed, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Third word, statement, is where you find his words of assurance that are given to the thief. Luke 23, verse 43. 
You know, Jesus, of course, was crucified between two thieves. They had three crosses prepared that day, one for Barabbas and one for each of his associates. Barabbas went free. Jesus died on the cross of Barabbas. By the way, you and I are like Barabbas. He takes our place. He is our substitute. And there's a thief on the right and there's a thief on the left. Jesus is crucified right in the middle. As the prophecy said, he'd be numbered with the transgressors. Right in the midst. And as they're hanging there, at first, everybody engages in mocking him. And even the thief on the right and the left, they said, if you're the Savior, save us. Can you do anything? But as the hours drag on, the thief ostensibly on the right. It doesn't say specifically in the Bible, but, you know, since Jesus separates the sheep and the goats, and the goats are on the left, and the sheep are on the right, I'm assuming this was the sheep, and so he's on the right. I can't prove that, but you can't disprove it, so we're going to say he's on the right. <laughs> so, and so this thief, who it also says is a robber, he was guilty of insurrection, and they had participated in at least a murder that... Uh, realizes he's dying, he looks at Jesus and something happens along the way. He sees them gambling for his clothing and casting lots and he remembers Psalm 22. He looks and he sees his hands and his feet pierced and he remembers Psalm 22. He sees the sign above the head of Christ on the cross. This is the king of the Jews. Remember, they wanted to change that. Pilate said, I'm not changing it. What I've written, I've written. This is the king of the Jews. And the Holy Spirit sees him. He heard when they were being crucified, he heard from the background noise, he heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them. And he thought, what kind of man is this? Maybe as he hung on the cross, he saw some of the others weeping and saying, he raised my child to life. He healed my, my diseases. And, and the mind is, you know, your things happen very quickly when you're dying quickened by adrenaline and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he suddenly sees in Jesus, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And while everybody around the cross is mocking Christ, he makes that statement, and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, friends, this is phenomenal. It really is. Because nobody, even his apostles at the cross, were not calling him Lord. Furthermore, the man said, when you come into your kingdom, that implies you've got a king. Now, that takes incredible faith because Jesus hanging on the cross, all but naked, bleeding, beaten, defeated, nearly blue, does not look like he can save anybody. To call him a king, to call him a lord, took incredible faith. And I think the whole crowd suddenly got very quiet says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you know what? In spite of all of his suffering, agony, mocking, everything he was going through, Jesus always heard a prayer from a repentant sinner. Jesus may not always answer your prayer when you give him your Christmas list of all the things you want. But if you come to Christ and you are contrite for your sins and you repent, he will always hear that prayer. And Jesus immediately responded when he heard why did Jesus come to seek and to save the lost he had come to save sinners and here was a sinner in his closing hours bringing joy to his heart that his mission was not vain and he turned to him right away and he said verily I am telling you today you will be with me in paradise now I've got to clear this up it happens whenever we read this verse some people think that that thief went to be with Jesus in paradise that day it's because of where the comma is placed in the translation. Popular English translations say, Verily I say unto you, to, verily I say unto you, comma, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's not the way it reads. First of all, I can prove it from the Bible. If you read in John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus talks to Mary after the resurrection. He says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. So Mary had not even been, to, I'm sorry, Jesus had not yet been to the Father. On Sunday morning, how could the thief be with him that same day, Friday afternoon? So he's not saying that. What Jesus is saying is, I am telling you today, though I do not look like a king, today, though I do not look like a savior, today when all of this is happening and things may look hopeless, I'm making a promise today, you will be with me in paradise. See the difference? Interesting story from history. I thought you'd find 
fascinating. Maria Faradun, the Empress of Russia, she was the wife of Tsar Alexander III. And she was known for her philanthropy, very loving, generous person. And periodically the Tsar would consign people to be sent to Siberia as a punishment. And this one prisoner, she felt sorry for him. Her husband had written a note, pardon impossible, comma, to be sent to Siberia. She got a hold of the note before it made it to the uh, officials and she wrote, pardon, comma, impossible to be sent to Siberia. And the man was set free because of the moving of one comma. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? A single comma. And so he was telling him this. Now these two thieves represent all of humanity. One is saved, one is lost. They are both helpless to save themselves. You can see that uh, they're sort of a symbol of all of us. They're, all, they're guilty of murder, of stealing, of blasphemy. They couldn't save themselves. They both had an opportunity to be saved. They both have Christ by them, but only one is saved because one calls out. You know, he publicly confessed his sin. He said to his fellow thief, we are receiving what we deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. He is declaring that Jesus is innocent. They're confessing publicly, or he was confessing publicly his sin. He met all the criteria of salvation, and Jesus said, you will be saved. And I think at that moment that the heavens briefly parted and a ray of light came through the darkness and shone on that man to just confirm that God had heard his prayer. Now he, just because he repented of his sins and he was saved does not mean he came down from the cross. You may come to Christ and he will forgive your sins, but it does not always reverse your circumstances. Sometimes he still had to bear with the circumstances of his life, but he had eternal life now because he turned to Jesus, meaning everybody can have the life that lasts forever if we come to Christ. You know what I think is amazing about this? Is even though Jesus' hands were nailed to the tree, the devil could not keep the Savior from saving. There's nothing Satan could do to stop him from saving. The other thing that we learn personally from this, in spite of Christ's personal suffering, did he ever stop witnessing to others? Even from the cross, Jesus was sharing his faith. If you wait until everything is convenient for you to witness, you'll never witness. You know when you are the best witness? When you are witnessing through trials. It is as we are going through trials and we bear ourselves patiently as Christians, we are the best witnesses. Christ showed that in his interaction with the thief on the cross. Fourth statement is a statement of abandonment. And I was struggling to find the right word for this, but I think this will work. Matthew 27, verse 46, when Christ, during the ninth hour, this is the closing moments, he cries out with a loud voice, and he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I think it's very important to understand, Jesus never asked a question because he didn't know something. Did Jesus know why he was on the cross? Of course. Did he know why he was separated from the Father? Sure. He prayed it wouldn't happen in the garden because he knew what was going to happen. So why is he saying this? Did Jesus get discouraged? No. You read in Isaiah 42, this prophecy about the Messiah, he will not fail or be discouraged. Did Jesus lose faith and despair? No. Jesus is asking a sublime rhetorical question. He is quoting from Psalm 22. The first verse in Psalm 22 is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is Jesus quoting from Psalm 22? Well, let's think about it. Let's read a little further down in that psalm. Go to verse 7. It says here, All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. This was called a messianic psalm. The Jews believed this was a psalm that told us about the Messiah. Jesus, in making that statement, was acting the part of the high priest a few hundred yards away on the Passover in the temple was supposed to read from a messianic psalm. Christ, our high priest, was reading from a messianic psalm because now he is the Lamb of God and he's asking the people around the cross, pay attention to the words of this psalm. 
should have triggered something in their minds. Read down in Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They often whip them until their bones showed. And they look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, how could he orchestrate that? This, to me, is one of the most incredible prophecies. You realize Psalm 22 is written 1,000 years before Jesus is born, approximately. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls this psalm was written before Jesus was born. How perfectly does this identify the sufferings of Christ by crucifixion, which was not even practiced by the Jews when David wrote it? When he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's kind of like when he said to Adam, where are you? In making that statement, he's basically saying, this is why I am forsaken by the Father for you. He's asking us why. Father, why have you forsaken me? He's inviting all of us to answer that question for me. You know, um, all right, I want to read something to you real quick. Now, Michelle, don't jump at the piano. I, not, this is not the appeal. I showed this to her earlier. I said, this will be near the end of the sermon, but I changed my mind. <laughs> this is from the book, Desire of Ages. Just a, a, a beautiful statement, and it's from page 756. This is that classic on the book of Christ. If you've never heard of it before, you should read it, Desire of Ages. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross. His flesh lacerated with stripes. Those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet so tireless on ministries of love spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by the crown of thorns. Those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe. And all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to every child of humanity, declaring, it is for thee that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice, and this from love to thee. The love of God is best demonstrated on the cross. This is why Paul says, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The fifth statement of Jesus on the cross, his anguish. John 19, 28, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. What scripture is being fulfilled? Well, a lot of scriptures are being fulfilled. But there's even a scripture about his thirst. You read in Psalm 22, I deliberately left out verse 15 and saved it till now. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. You've brought me to the dust of death. It talks about his thirst. You read also in Psalm 69, 21. They gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. You know, I think it's fascinating that the first miracle of Jesus, and John emphasizes this in John chapter 2, in Cana, he turns water into pure grape juice. He didn't make booze. It's pure grape juice. At the Last Supper, he calls it new wine. He says, I'll not drink this again until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. He gives it at a wedding feast. Now he is dying on the cross. Man offers him sour wine. He basically makes a transfusion. He says, I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to give you my sinlessness, my purity. I'm going to take your weakness. I'm going to give you my power. And they gave that to him for his thirst. I don't know that he was able to taste very much of it because as they offered it to him, they misunderstood what he was saying when he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. In Aramaic, it sounded like he was saying Elijah with a crowd and everything. And some of the religious leaders said, don't give him anything to drink. Let's see if Elijah helps him. So no sooner had they put the sponge to his lips than they pulled it away again. But that gave him just enough for his last words 
that we'll get to in just a moment. But here it foretells his thirst. Psalm 42, verse 1, David says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? As I was studying this the other day, I had to get up and go get something to drink. It just made me thirsty thinking about it. John 19, verse 34, when the soldiers pierced his side following his death, immediately blood and water came out, separated. He was thirsting that he might provide us with that water of life. You remember, it's John in his gospel. The only one tells us about the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus said, whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst, but the waters that I give will be in them a well, a fountain of water springing up. It's artesian unto everlasting life. He gives you the Holy Spirit and it continues to satisfy you as you keep the well clean by prayer every day. You pray for God's Spirit every day. It will refresh your soul. The Bible promises your cup will run over. Amen? Jesus said, Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus, separated from the Father, bearing our sins, said, I thirst. He was feeling the thirst for righteousness because he had lost righteousness. He was carrying our sin at that moment. I thirst. Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? The promise is if you do, you'll be filled. You will search for me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. It's a hunger. It's something you crave. If food starts getting later and later, you find some way to solve it, don't you? You become very motivated. If you, if you get hungry enough, you start thinking about where can I pull over? Where can I get some money? It's a drive. And do you have that drive for holiness? Do you hunger for righteousness? And Jesus challenges us to have that. Statement number six is accomplishment. I held up my hand, but I've only got five fingers. So it's six. And that's in John 19, verse 30. Jesus, when he received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Now, this is one of the most glorious statements on the cross. Matter of fact, when he makes the statement in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all say with a loud voice. It emphasizes with a loud voice. Now, here he's been choked and thirsty, and maybe that little taste of the sour wine just cleared his throat enough. But um, there was a, a Holy Spirit-inspired roar that came from Jesus. And it was a word. These are words of triumph, words of accomplishment. His mission is successful. Now, the Greek word here, when it says it is finished, is teleo. And teleo doesn't mean, uh, you know, just like you finished your homework so much. as It means like a bill is paid in full. So when he said it is finished, he was saying our debt is canceled. That he had drank the very bottom dregs of the sin of the world. He'd taken it all within himself. He paid for the sin of every human who has ever lived, who is living now, or who will ever live. He'd taken it all. He fulfilled the prophecies. He fulfilled the promises. He fulfilled the, the provisions were fulfilled. Christ said in Luke 12, verse 50, But I have a baptism to undergo. How distressed I am until it is completed. Jesus was distressed. He wanted to get through it. He did not want to fail until he knew that we could be redeemed. For the joy that was set before him of you and I being saved, he endured the cross. And finally, word came from the Father, it is enough. And Jesus roared with triumph, it is finished. You know, there's a couple of commentators I'd like to quote. First one, I did not make a note of who it is. I forget it. Maybe John Gill. The toils in ministry, the persecutions and mockeries, the pangs in the garden and the cross are ended. Man is redeemed. What a wonderful declaration was this. How full of consolation. Adam Clark said, It is as if he said, I have executed the great designs of the Almighty. I have satisfied the demands of his justice. I have accomplished all that was written in the prophets and suffered the utmost malice of my enemies. 
And now the way to the Holy of Holies is made manifest through my blood, an awful yet glorious finish. Through this tragic death, God is reconciled to man, and the kingdom of heaven is open to every believing soul. What a wonderful promise, that declaration, it is finished. It was a, it's a declaration of triumph. It's a declaration of someone coming to you and saying, don't worry about the debt, I've got it. It's paid in full. Finally, point seven, the statement seven, words of acceptance. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he says, it is finished. And there's a pause. And then he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I think right then, you know, it says that darkness covered the land at this time. And again, you can read in that book, Desire of Ages, but when he declared it is finished, something happened. The clouds parted, and a ray of light came through and shone upon the sun. And everybody there saw that, and he cried, it is finished. Then he declared the last statement, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. These are words of acceptance. All of us can count on that acceptance. And he breathed his last. You know what the first words of Jesus are recorded in his earthly life? He said, I must be about my father's business. Now his last words before his resurrection, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He had completed the business of the father. He begins his ordeal, ordeal in the garden by saying, not my will. He ends his ordeal by saying, into your hands. And Jesus here, he exemplifies perfect submission to the Father in what he did for us here on the cross. At the last, Jesus declares his faith, and uh, we are redeemed. You know, I'd like to remind you of what happened. After Jesus makes this statement, the light shines through. The earth shakes. There's an earthquake. People are thrown to the ground. Rocks are rent. Graves are opened. This is so stunning that a Roman soldier, a centurion who's there to guard and oversee the execution, he says, surely this was the Son of God. He sees all of nature is responding to his declaration. Now that's what's happening out on Golgotha. In the temple at that very moment, the priests are getting ready to offer the sacrificial lamb. Again, I'm reading from that favorite book, Desire of Ages. With a loud cry, it is finished, came from the lips of Christ. The priests were officiating in the temple. It was the hour of the evening sacrifice. The lamb, representing Christ, had been brought to be slain. Clothed in his significant and beautiful dress, the priest stood with lifted knife, as did Abraham when he was about to slay his son. With intense interest, the people were looking on. But the earth begins to tremble and quake, for the Lord himself draws near. With a rending noise, the inner veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom by an unseen hand. Now, according to um, Alfred Erdersheim, the um, uh, historian, he says that veil was 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, and as thick as the palm of a man's hand, woven in 72 separate squares. It was a massive veil. Suddenly, from top to bottom, right down the middle, it is torn by an unseen hand, like the hand that wrote on the walls of Babylon's banquet hall. It's rent in twain during this earthquake. The stones in this temple begin to jiggle in their places on one another. Here's where God had manifested His glory above the mercy seat. And they can look in now and say, the mercy seat, the ark is not there. It had never been recovered since it was hidden by probably Jeremiah and some of the priests before the Babylonian captivity. No one but the high priest was to ever lift the veil and look inside this place. He just entered once a year, but now it's torn into the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary is no longer sacred. All is terror and confusion. The priest is about to slay its victim, but the knife drops from his nerveless hand and the lamb escapes. Type has met anti-type in the death of Jesus, God's Son. The great sacrifice has been made. The way to the holiest is laid open. A new and a living way is prepared for all. 
no longer need sinful sorrow in humanity to wait the coming of the high priest. Henceforth, the Savior was there to officiate as priest and advocate in the heaven of heavens. It was as if a living voice had spoken to the worshipers, there is now an end to all the sacrifices and offerings for sin. The Son of God has come according to his word. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me to do your word, O Lord. By his own blood he enters in once into the holy place, having obtained earthly redemption for us. Now, through the blood of Christ, we can go directly to the Father. When Jesus said, it is finished, and he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Type met anti-type. This is a great changing part in biblical history. The whole sacrificial system, it met its fulfillment. Christ is the Lamb of God, and it's through his blood that we all can come directly to the Father and be forgiven. You know, friends, I think that this is a wonderful truth. And I hope that as years go by and as you're a Christian that the story of the cross does not, you don't become hardened or callous to it. We don't become numb. You know, it's not appropriate that I should talk to you about what Jesus did for us on the cross and those statements of Christ without giving you an opportunity to respond to that. What he said to that thief, today you can be with me in paradise. He said, I'm telling you today, he can promise you today you can be with him in paradise. What he said to the soldiers, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wants you to be forgiven. Talking about last words, the uh, German poet, Hedrick Hein, when he was dying, his last words were, forgive me. Yes, God will forgive me. That's his business. And Jesus came into the world to seek and to save the lost. So what must I do to be forgiven? It'd be a shame for you to leave today and be like that thief on the left who died in his sins. Everybody's going to be on one side or the other. Jesus from the cross was like Jesus on his judgment throne between those two thieves. Are you going to be the one who calls out and says, Lord, remember me? Just by faith, he called out. He confessed his sins. He was sorry for his sins. And he accepted the free gift. The gift is being offered. Jesus says, I am giving my son. God so loved the world that he gave his son there on the cross. He suffered for all your sins. And when you see him there suffering, if you were the only one who had ever sinned, he would have had to go through that just for you. And now God says, did he die for you in vain? The father asks you, did he die for you in vain? Or are you willing to repent of your sins and accept me? You just simply say, yes, Lord, I come. I want to accept that forgiveness. And then he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent of your sins. When you get off by yourself, kneel down, confess your particular sins to God and ask for strength. And pray and plan by his grace to live in a newness of life. He won't ask you to do something without giving you the power to do it. Do you believe that, friends? There may be some here today and you've kind of grown numb about your Christian experience and you need that renewal. Or maybe you've never made that decision to really take up the offer of salvation Jesus gives on the cross. You can do that right now. Before we sing our closing song, if you'd like to do that, I invite you to stand. And there may be some who are watching. You can make that decision. We know there are many at home that are tuning in. You'd like to say, yes, Lord, I want that mercy. I want Jesus' blood to cover my sins. I want to be forgiven. And let's accept it so all of us today can hear Christ say, I'm promising you today, you will be with me in paradise. What a wonderful promise that we could have eternal life and all our sins forgiven.